Thank you so much, and uh, thank you uh, again for inviting me to this uh, important uh, conference and uh, a lot of new contacts, hopefully. Um, I'm still uh, overwhelmed from the fantastic performance before, and um, I'm so happy to be able to listen to this. And also, I think it was fantastic to see how music, culture, and heritage could be such a starting point for this important conference. And um, I will come back to this relation between culture and cultural heritage uh, in my speech here. So anyway, um, I've been involved in, uh, in cultural heritage and sustainable development for, for a very long time now, 30 years. Uh, and uh, I think it is, of course, of importance that I can also see that uh, heritage has been more involved in these processes uh, recently. And I think that we still are in, um, in the initial stage of this. But I think it's also uh, interesting and maybe also important to, to take a, a step backwards so, and listen to, oh, we'll see what's been happening for the last, let's say, 50 years. Um, last year it was a um, <coughs> celebration of the 50 years of the World Heritage Convention, you know, World Heritage Sites, uh, which uh, was an important uh, achievement for the heritage, also in the international field, of course. And, um, <coughs> and also, let's say, brought the heritage community or family together, maybe. Um, and I think that many of us, or those that were involved from the very beginning, also saw the relation to, to sustainability. And I also think that the heritage community regarded themselves as an important member of the sustainable development movement from the very beginning. But <coughs> I don't think everybody accepted that. Um, the same year it was what often is regarded as the first international environmental conference, and it was actually in Stockholm, 1972. And um, <clears throat> that was the starting point for and the very first conferences for many, been followed up by many important conferences, and, and you know them in Rio de Janeiro, Kyoto, uh, Johannesburg, etc., and uh, Paris, and, um, and all these important conferences. But you can say it took almost 50 years until cultural heritage was mentioned in such documents. And I think that is something that you need to keep in mind, that even if we regard that what we are doing, it's so important also for the heritage, uh, not just for the heritage, but also for the sustainability, I think it's important to understand that we had had a long journey until we became full members of this community. And I think that we need to struggle for that all the time. And um, in, in this, um, you, you've seen this. Have you seen this before? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, anyway, and you know that um, in um, goal number 11, you, you say that you, you should uh, protect the heritage. It's uh, the famous target 11.4, as you know. Uh, <clears throat> but I think, Another thing is very interesting here also. Since it, it's a goal, or since it is a target, you need to understand when you have reached or achieved that target. So how can you do that? Of course, you need some indicators. And the indicator for 11.4, do, do you know what the indicator is? How can we know if we have protect cultural heritage in a good way? I mean, it's easy to say, protect heritage. But how can we know that? The indicator is the total expenditure of, for protection of cultural heritage. I, and many with me, think that that is not a correct understanding of the heritage. It is not a cost to the society. It is something else. And this is what I want to speak to, to you today. So <clears throat> I think that goes back to an, an idea that was that uh, conservation of cultural heritage was an obstacle for development in general. And this was uh, 
why many of the important or val <coughs> valuable environment was destroyed because they wanted to build something else that was easier to understand from an economic growth point of view. Um, but I also think that um, that was also in some way the mindset of the heritage community. So <coughs> it was kind of an uh, against attitude. And preservation became often in many situations more moral uh, duty and understanding and also discussion about morality. And that means that it didn't really meet the important policy makers and decision makers. It kind of spoke two different uh, languages. But it was also <coughs> an understanding or maybe an agreement that um, heritage was a cost to the society. And <coughs> that means that, we, the, let's say, the, um, the um, praxis within the conservation um, uh, sector was to see how <coughs> we can reach uh, or be better from, um, to protect. So the protection was pretty much in focus from the very beginning. And to be able to do that, there was a lot of information needed, a lot of knowledge needed, and, uh, and uh, heritage communities so they started a lot of inventory mapping, uh, research, and etc. But the important thing was, I think, the analysis, the heritage analysis, to see how we can understand how <coughs> important or the values from heritage. And I think that maybe that was also um, what differed the heritage and conservation and cultural heritage um, from other professionals. So that was the responsibility for, 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 um, for the heritage. And this is just a, <coughs> a photo from, from uh, the Swedish West Coast. And, um, and <coughs> I use my students to, to see if, if they can recognize some heritage here. And, and uh, <coughs> I think that more or less all of them start with a church, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> But it has a little bit interesting story because uh, there is something else that is regarded as more valuable to protect, actually. So this is uh, one of Sweden's world heritage sites. So that is actually <coughs> Grimeton radio station, which was, the, was regarded as the very first uh, wireless global communication network because it was um, the first uh, wireless one. Um, um, radio station, <laughs> global network around the world. Anyway, <clears throat> so, um, so this, you can say that heritage in the 1970s and uh, at least in the Western world, I think it, it goes around the whole world, was focused on the preservation of and mostly of the protection of monuments. Um, <clears throat> but after a while, it was not um, so black and white, so to say, that we need to protect something and we can leave the other. We needed also to see how these could fit into the, let's say, the bigger picture, uh, to, to be a more full member of the society, if you say so. And that was also the struggle for, for the heritage community to be accepted by other sectors of the society. And that, of course, with, Let's say, when you grow up, you <coughs> often you don't have these black and white uh, perspectives. Maybe you have as a teenager. It is also a gray zone somewhere. You need to be more flexible and understand other, other interests, other values, other people, other um, etc. So um, um, after one of the, uh, let's say, most, uh, one, uh, one important uh, um, conservationist was uh, this Sir Bernard Field that said it is about a dynamic management of change. And I think that is very interesting to see how it could be more flexible oriented. So it's not just uh, this, um, um, <coughs> this uh, um, let's say, black and white um, understanding of what is valuable and what is not valuable. Anyway, another important step was taken by an economist uh, from Australia, David Frosby that introduced uh, culture as such into the economic field. And this also opened up for another kind of understanding. So he introduced the, um, the concept of culture capital. And uh, he also 
try to understand them and, um, and develop a lot of um, research methodologies to see how you can actually calculate the value uh, uh, of, um, of heritage in different ways uh, with different methodologies. Uh, Cost-benefit analysis, for instance, willingness to pay, etc. But the interesting thing here, <coughs> since he introduced this concept of country capital, that means that what we are doing here is more to un be understood as investments. So it's not a cost to the society, instead it is an investment for the future. And of course you can understand investments for the future in monetary terms, but <coughs> what we are interested to do is to see if it could also be understood in within the concept of sustainable development, meaning that you can see that the return of this investment could be understood in environmental sustainability, in social sustainability, but also in economic sustainability. So that means that <coughs> from this we can see uh, in many countries um, around the world, and especially maybe in the Western world, we could see that <coughs> the heritage um, let's say community was not just for the, for the few, it became more and more important for, for, for um, more people. And um, you, can, you can easily see this with, um, for instance, that um, for the tourist in industry, that um, it was an extremely um, increase in, in, in tourist visiting historic sites and especially World Heritage sites. Maybe we will listen to this uh, later on in this conference. But it was also an interest for, for keeping the buildings in, his, in, in a way and see what kind of knowledge has been lost during this period and what kind of knowledge needed to be um, <coughs> redeveloped, so to say. And uh, it, it comes with the material and, um, and the craftsmanship. And we, and we conducted a study here some years ago that we can see the actual prices for, for um, houses when you're on, on, on the open market. And we <coughs> it was very clear that the higher grade of protection a building had, the higher price it was on the, on the market. So we, and this is what we can see that today people are willing to pay, so to so say, for, for this um, historic building. <laughs> <coughs> that is, has a positive side, but it also, of course, has a negative side um, and um, <coughs> in connection to, to gentrification and things like that, for instance. Anyway, <coughs> I was part uh, of a, an, a project in the 90s and in, in the beginning of the 21st century um, where we try to, to see if we can train uh, Craft, uh, construction workers in traditional building techniques because we simply didn't have anybody, <laughs> anyone in the region that was able to do um, the restoration, the practical restoration. So we needed to, to find a way to train them. And, and we had opportunity to, to work together with the construction industry and also the trade unions in the construction industry, but also with the, with the government bodies, especially the labor market body. Uh, and um, so we could take money from the labor market board and <coughs> train unemployed construction workers in traditional building techniques and meanwhile they could restore a building. So, um, so we saved, you can say, 100 buildings in, in this region from demolition and, uh, and we also trained several uh, construction workers, approximately one third of all the construction workers in the region. Uh, but the interesting thing was that we also started to have a more focus on the adaptive reuse. How can you actually not just pr preserve them and leave them, how can heritage sector be also be responsible to find an adaptive reuse <coughs> that could, so to say, pay the rent for, 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 the, uh, for the future years so that the <coughs> property had some res um, the property owner had some resources to, to continue the maintenance of the building. So, and we were very interested to see if this adaptive reuse could also be in line with the strategies for sustainable development in the region, because that would also take the heritage sector to be, let's say, a more important partner in the overall work with the sustainability. But we were also interested to see if these, um, since we, we had a lot of 
uh, let's say, uh, um, public sector um, was very much involved in these processes and we were interested to see if we can develop the uh, planning of the new activity or the adaptive reuse. And we were also interested to see if it also could be linked not just to, to um, um, let's say, tourist industry or, or, or more consumer-oriented business um, um, use. We were also interested to see if it could also be in place for more future-oriented activities. And we were interested to see if we can start a, um, a strong col uh, collaboration with uh, um, the creative industries, but also the innovation uh, industries. So I'd like to show this uh, that um, Jane Jacobs, I, I don't know if you heard about her. Otherwise, I can strongly recommend you to read her. And, and let's say that your summer vacation is saved because you, now you're going to read Jane Jacobs. Um, fantastic author. Um, anyway, she said that old ideas can sometimes use new buildings, but new ideas must use old buildings. So we took this with us and see if it was actually something that you can uh, kind of prove uh, or give evidence to. And, and we believed in that and we started the planning to see if we can gather these kind of activities together in some buildings. So <clears throat> with this we took a step into see if we cannot just be responsible for a building and the, the heritage um, um, Heritage values uh, uh, in, that you can, in the, in, in, that uh, you can understand from the building itself, and we were not just to see if we can maintain these because we needed this uh, better knowledge and um, and um, quality of work, so to say, in the restoration and conservation. <coughs> we took a step and see if we can be the drivers to to find new. Um, adaptive reuse of the buildings and how this could be in line with the idea of uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable development. So, um, so we started to, to, to understand this and started to develop this. And I think that um, we also have a long discussion about what is actually conservation? How can we be understood? Is it just to, to, to make a building for instance, um, to look like um, what it looked like from the very beginning, or is it something else? I think that this is some of the, the words that come up from, from, from our research and uh, the book that we published uh, some one or two year, years ago. And I think that um, maybe conservation is the idea of taking care of existing resources. I, I like that, because it also gives us a more future-oriented approach. So conservation of cultural heritage is not just about yesterday, so to say. It is about the future and what, and what can we bring, so to say, into the future and how can we use that in, in, in the future. So, <coughs> so um, <coughs> for me it has been um, value to understand the development of conservation sector, if I use that word, uh, started from the protection only, um, uh, only focus. Then uh, after the, making the decision or, um, and decided what to preserve, you needed to be able to take care of it. And in many countries, Sweden for instance, we lost that knowledge. Uh, we at that time we trained craftsmanship, uh, sorry, uh, cons uh, construction oh. workers only in modern techniques. But uh, if you look at the construction industry, just a few pr percentage of the construction, uh, construction industry is about new buildings. Most of them is about uh, renovation or restoration or, uh, of existing uh, construction. So that means that <coughs> this kind of knowledge is also valuable for the construction industry. Anyway, but what we are focused on today is to see if we can find this adaptive reuse and how it could be linked to, to, to the general world of, of um, uh, sustainability. Um, <clears throat> I have just finished a study of um, Romania and the city of Cluj. And here, um, UNESCO 
um, we have been tested new indicators for cultural heritage. Because, as we all understand, it, it was not enough to just uh, evaluate the cost of the society or the, um, um, the <coughs> total expenditure of cultural heritage. So, um, UNESCO has developed this scheme, and today <coughs> there are 22 new indicators, and you can put them together <coughs> in what you can see here environment and resilience. Prosperity and livelihoods, knowledge and skills, and inclusion, inclusion and participation. And this means it has been much more focused on uh, social values and um, also much stronger focus on um, relation between people and uh, much stronger focus on uh, also on uh, economics in, 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 uh, in a broader perspective. So so what we are doing now is to see how we can link this to, to, to um, the re overall regional planning. Because in, at the regional level there are planning um, strategies for, for sustainable development, obviously. But <clears throat> they are, when we take a closer look at this, it is a, a strong opening for, for heritage to be a much stronger part within this. So, <clears throat> so we had... Um, had conducted some studies to see if cultural heritage and culture as such are actually involved and given priority in these regional development strategies. And um, you can say they are not. So this is the result. You can see it's less than 10 percentage that in Europe give priority to this. And if you took a look uh, at the map, you can see that, for instance, in Sweden, we don't have any regions that give in priority to heritage. <coughs> and um, <coughs> some of the in, the in the southern parts of Europe. So, so what we are now starting to, do, to, to see if we can find a way to culture and cultural heritage to have a strong position and give them more strong priority in such uh, policy documents. So. <coughs> So what we have been doing is to, first of all, understand culture as such and the relation between culture and sustainable development and sustainable economic development. So um, we have conducted such studies in, in many regions in, 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 uh, in Sweden, but also in, in Europe. And um, so we simply map all cultural activities and uh, also cultural facilities and interesting was in, in this study we saw that one of the most important values for culture events as such was actually the churches. And, and, but when it comes to the policy making decision strategies, it was not so obvious for these guys that the churches also had this important role, especially for the local societies. And, and we just saw it uh, here. <coughs> so anyway, so with this we can also uh, calculate with advanced um, mathematical uh, models and algorithms, we can see where culture has the biggest <coughs> impact on the uh, regional society, so to say. And with this, uh, we can also forecast uh, the future and see how it changes, if culture will have a bigger um, um, role or, or if it changes in, in different ways. But we can also split this and see the strongest relation for culture and other activities because every single point we have the GIS coordinators so we can load them with all the statistics for, for a region. So here <coughs> we can see what seems to be the most important driver for the local and regional development and where come culture in and then <coughs> based on this we can now see how we can create strong partnership with culture and the surrounding society so to say. And this is, will also go for for your activities. So we can simply see and how we can create stronger uh, alliance between different actors. And <coughs> we can also take this and change the figures or the values of each point, which means that we can forecast different uh, scenarios. So we can make simulations, and this is what we've been doing, and it's uh, so we more or less see what's happening if we increase the value, meaning maybe from a more people are oriented to this, then what will happen? <coughs> this is just another one. Um, <coughs> so, but this is also an, 
entrance to the more important policy documents. And this is what we now want to do to see if this is also the opening door to see if we can be part of this important policy document called regional development strategies. So, so we just finished a, 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 a huge EU research project where we tested these ideas, so sorry. Um, and there we had workshops with local groups, local communities that was responsible in some way for, for heritage building. Most of them were abandoned or partly empty. Maybe you, <coughs> it could be also interesting for, for what you are doing. To, to see how can you actually start new activities based on the mapping, based on this strange figure I saw so, so you. We invited them, then we helped them with what we call a circle business model. And the idea is to see if we can find a, a strong, um, a, an opportunity for a new adaptive reuse based on the sustainable development movement. I see. So for instance, in one of these sites we had, we had um, 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 a, a, a new industry that the factory was empty, had been there for 20, 25 years. And um, the village, people in the village was, of course, getting older and older. But uh, and so in this workshop model, we we find, find an uh, investor that was interested to take the waste from the forest and see if they can produce a new material that could replace plastic. And this is the way. So it's not just cultural activities as such. So, <clears throat> so what we do now is to see how we can link this to both in innovation and circle economy. And um, <clears throat> this is also a way to understand where heritage can find a new um, place in the planning society. And I, I will just show the last slide. And this is what I've been doing for more or less the last five years, is within Europe to see if culture can take a place as the, one of the most important sector or business or industries for innovation in Europe. And, uh, and um, we were successful. So um, I think it was a couple of months before the pandemic, um, the European Commission decided to say that culture and creativity is one of the most, one of the nine most important sectors for innovation in Europe. So now there is a huge budget, um, I think uh, uh, around uh, 100 million euros per year for 10 years to see how we can develop new innovative activities or re relations between different actors in Europe. And I think this is also goes for you. So, <clears throat> and recently, just one or two weeks ago, there was the first call. So I just Google this uh, culture and creativity and then you had the call. And I think that uh, it could be uh, of interest for you. I will just say that this is just the aperitivo. This is a small project because the first January 24, that will be the big one. So please, what you can do here is prepare yourself, see if you can find a way to see how what, <coughs> the, what you're doing here could be of importance for, for these um, activities because I think and strongly believe that you have a good opportunity. So looking forward, maybe you can ask me about this tonight. Uh, happy to help you. So thank you so much. Um, 
Yes, I, I was thinking maybe we need a new conference. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, since you're from Britain, right? Uh, I can say that we, we had a lot, several uh, European uh, collaborations. And uh, I will say that um, the f one of the most important ones was uh, when we started in the Baltic Sea region. And the decision made for us to, to go abroad, so to say, or export our ideas to the, uh, to the, the Baltic Sea countries, and, and especially Poland, the driver and the man that took that decision was the Swedish prime minister himself. And he did it with a negotiation with the Polish prime minister. So he more, more or less said, I, I don't know if he really said this, but I believe that he said, OK, you can get the Haaland model. Because it was kind of give and take uh, opportunities. So we, we were working there for, I don't know, for, uh, for many years. But um, we, were, we were also um, um, negotiating <laughs> to start it in, in, in the UK and uh, in, in Wales, for instance, we're together with this regional development agencies in, in Wales, and we have some good sites there. But we were also in London, so I, I put together a team. It was more or less me, uh, from the construction industry, the, the <coughs> training centers, the trade unions, and um, the, the, the region, the, the Greater London Authority. And, and when I came back after we had a meeting, so we were, you know, more or less agreed everybody. I went back and then we come back with the, you know, the document, the application document. And then they said that, um, well, we had a discussion here and we, we asked the mayor and about opinion from him. And it was Ken Livingstone at the time. Um, Ken Livingstone was, you know, the strike leader and um, during the Thatcher area. And he said that, of course, uh, unemployment and uh, unemployed construction workers, it's very interesting, but maybe you should go for the Bangladesh community instead, because there was some, he had some ideas to bring them into the society. So it was more, how can you get, you know. So I thought it was extremely interesting to see how it could also be used to get people together. It was not just about unemployment, it was not just about the building, it was actually community. It was people oriented. And we used that idea, we took the idea from Ken Livingstone, so to say, when we, when we were planning to start it in, in Budapest, for instance, and then we have an idea to, to bring the Roman people into it. So, so we plan to restore a building there so it could be kind of their community house and also to, 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 get, to, to create trust between people because that was it, was more or less about trust Starting from the labor market board and the heritage sector, this was, I will not say enemies, but it was a, we said that we spoke Swedish, but we didn't understand each other because we spoke completely different languages. And um, so <coughs> does it have an impact? Yes and no, uh, because the policy, uh, policies has changed a lot since this time. And, um, and so you have to find another route, so to say. We try to, to see how we can be linked to the structural funds, and um, and at the moment, and um, but <clears throat> let's say that we focus more on the uh, adaptive reuse oriented, and see uh, one more time how we can bring people together, create trust, and also over the generations, and uh, and I also to see how how we can help uh, people with idea to to actually start something because it's it's easy maybe let's say it's easy to have an idea but it's very difficult to 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 to, to start something so thank you thank you so much it was very interesting to have this conservation 1.0 2.0 very well uh, uh, explained how cultural heritage and also culture is moving forward. And that you explained so clearly, as, as FRH also is pushing all the time, that it is multidisciplinary. Mm. And, and it's about urban planning and future and resilient societies. And uh, uh, I just want to stress that indeed research is of such great importance 
in order to help cultural heritage people to explain to policy makers, to influence. Mm. And therefore, I am so pleased that also, well, that you are now a keynote speaker, but uh, also that it is now very clear to everybody more and more that we have to work together and cooperate in different fields mm. and not only focus on preservation and conservation mm. and so on. <coughs> so I, I just wanted to give you this compliment because this is also uh, average is working on, on the European level to push the doors open and this 100 million is again a step forward. Mm. So on many different levels we all cooperate together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I can just say I, I, I agree with you and uh, and um, I, I, I think that um, we can cont continue this discussion during the days here, but uh, I think that you have a lot of experience that maybe is, uh, could be developed within this new opportunity. And I also s want to say that um, take a, a closer look at these uh, regional development strategies, because we, we just... Uh, we will present a study here in, um, let's say, next month, um, where we have um, studied all the, the, these regional strategies for Sweden, the previous one and the new one, and also the impact, how they um, had an impact on the, on, on the funding mechanism for the structure funds. I mean, if it's, because they are the base for the structure funds. And what is the structure funds? Yeah. What is it? Um, <clears throat> do you know EU budget? Yeah. Let's say that 50% of the EU budget goes to agriculture. One third goes to regional development, and that is the structure fund. So it's one third of EU's total budget. So one more time, it's enormous amount of money. And this could be spent in different ways. But we all, and let's say we, are not so good at this. So we just uh, conducted a study and uh, uh, we s can see that um, culture is mentioned in the, in, I don't have the figure in front of me, but uh, I think it is less than the 50 percentage of the documents, maybe even less. And it is not mentioned in this way, as we just uh, listened to this fantastic music. It is more used in a sentence like people uh, come from different countries with different cultures. This is the only way. So it's not given priority for the funding mechanism. So I think that we together needs to be much better to, to see how we can be involved in this. And I believe that uh, it, is, it is not, uh, it is the same as the starting point, right? where I showed you this uh, UNESCO 72, 72 and, uh, and um, environmental conference in 1970. It took some time before heritage were really involved. And I think this is the same process we need to take for these regional development strategies. And we need to be part of it, because then we can also have a new kind of fundings. And I think that uh, will help you in, especially maybe in the smaller parishes around. Uh, uh, sorry for just speaking about Europe now, but uh, we, are, we are in Europe. <laughs> sorry for this. Yeah. Just to explain to everybody that is exactly what Average is doing on the European level. Because in 2015, we got an amendment and the Committee of the Regions, we, who is responsible for the, uh, for the budget of the, of the regional development. And as of uh, 2011, there was no mentioning of heritage, and there was no mentioning of religious heritage at all, as a, as a very subcategory which is enormous. And now it is. So this is what we do all together as members in different countries. And this is why, at the European level, it is so important to influence uh, the policy makers, because then the national authorities follow. Uh, this is the structural budget. It is very interesting to learn that you specifically focus on structural funding, which is a huge amount of funding in the EU. And uh, so uh, that's what, well, uh, and Rach sometimes have a webinar on how this funding works on the EU level. So please join in. They are for free. We do it one every year because it is very good to understand how this works from the top to the bottom. But it's very uh, nice to listen to that your research specifically focused on this structure. Okay. Yeah, so unfortunately the time is up. Uh, we'll now have a coffee break downstairs. Oh, much more important. <laughs> Thank you.
and good morning and, and everything else. Um, uh, just before I, I, I have been asked to talk about the House of Good, uh, but just quickly um, to let you know what the National Churches Trust does and who we are. Uh, does anybody know um, the number? Those of you from, from uh, Great Britain mustn't answer this. How many places of worship, of Christian places of worship, are there in the UK that we might, in theory, be asked to support? Does anybody know? Lillian, do you know? 45,000? A bit less than that now. Yeah, I think the latest number is 39,000. So there, there are 39,000 Christian places of worship that might um, come knocking on our door for help. So that's, that's quite a lot. Um, but we are um, a national charity and we work UK wide. Um, we ha actually can trace our roots back more than 200 years, um, but in our current form, about it's just over the 70 years, we've been working to support Christian places of worship. Somebody asked me, Michael asked me on the way here, would we identify as a religious charity? Um, no, in the sense that we're not promoting religion or, or evangelizing or anything, but all the, the buildings that we support were originally, of course, built uh, for the purpose of worship. And we are trying to keep them um, open and in use and loved and sustainable so that they can be there for many, many more years to come. Uh, and I say, um, if a building can be kept wind and watertight and warm and welcoming, then it can still be there to provide everything that it's been doing for, in many cases, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, and um, places of worship have withstood everything from the Reformation, the plague, uh, uh, the pandemic now, Brexit, everything. <laughs> and and um, we hope that churches are, will still be there. And interestingly, they are the first responders, quite often in a time of a crisis, uh, and also uh, in the heat wave, people were told to go to churches because they were very cool. Um, and now we've got the crisis where no one can afford to heat their home, so they perhaps go to the church, or assuming the church can afford to heat the church, and so on. So the church is there always adapting um, for, uh, for the communities for, for which they were built. Um, we have a new strategy, which is just about to be launched, we're just putting the final touches to uh, the pictures and tweaking, but we know what it is, so just very quickly to tell you, uh, we can break our new strategy into three quite, I hope, quite clear sections. One is um, build up, and that's the bit where we help um, with repairs, with maintenance, with helping churches with advice, um, how to um, you know, keep the infrastructure going and importantly we get grants out. Um, open up, which is uh, all about promoting the fact that churches are wonderful to visit and encourage friends to join us uh, and um, encourage churches to find a way of promoting what they do so that they, we get visitors and you get people walking into these, into these buildings largely. Uh, and speak up, um, which is our new, um, I guess we've always tried to do advocacy, policy work, raising the profile of churches, uh, and our trustees and all, all stakeholders have agreed that it would be really good um, to put some more resource into that area of work. So we are going to be concentrating more, um, and more, I guess, more strategically on um, doing some advocacy, lobbying, raising the profile and really trying to um, shout about uh, churches and the good things they do. Um, and that leads me on to talking about the House of Good, which is one of the things that we feel has gone, has been a great success for us over the last couple of years. Um, so uh, there are other things there that we, we're proud of as well, including distributing quite a bit of money, which came from the Culture Recovery Fund out of the pandemic. Um, but the House of Good report, um, which is, it is available online. I know this is a paper-free um, <laughs> conference, but I did sneak in um, <laughs> a couple of copies of the House of Good and its update. And uh, I'm a fundraiser as well, so whoever gives me the largest bid can take uh, the copies home with them uh, and uh, save me carrying them back via EasyJet. But um, we do have paper copies, seriously. If you prefer them, I'm very happy to post them to you, uh, but do tell me. And also, but they are available online. 
So to speak more um, about the House of Good, uh, I, for a long time I, I knew, uh, we all knew, um, the value, that there is a value in having a church in your community. And there's a value to, there's an economic value because people are employed there or it employs contractors or when you need your roof fixing or the gutter cleared and so on, you know, somebody gets paid to do that and so on. So there's, there's a value in the community, but how can you actually measure the true value, the heritage value, the cultural value, uh, and, and can we put a number on that which would help us in um, making our case for support, I guess, and putting the argument strongly to government and other people who perhaps don't realise what is the intrinsic value of having a place of worship in your community. Um, and so we set about trying to find a way of doing that and we looked for some a suitable um, e e e economist, uh, someone who could, you know, not an economist, but we need a proper economic metric for doing that. Uh, and so we commissioned um, an organisation which is called the State of Life, who did the economic number crunching and looking into all the different ways of measuring the values. I mean, interestingly, uh, we, we felt, you know, on the whole, heritage is quite, sometimes has been quite hard to measure. I mean, the previous talk was all about, you know, cultural value, social value, economic value, and so on. And, and how do you actually put a figure on it? And we wanted to help uh, raise the profile because there's been a lack of um, consistency in funding over the years for the places of worship and so on. And that's why we wanted to do that. And we wanted to draw people's attention to the value. And, and we found, um, we found in our first, in the study when we first produced it, uh, that the, the value of churches, uh, we, we estimated the value that churches bring to the economy every year. And then we updated the report when there was a new way of measuring, which is the government's green, the treasury in the UK, uh, green book, which is a bit like the Bible for the government, uh, which is why if you measure things in accordance with that, then they, they believe that it's true. And it is true anyway. So, so um, the, up, but it is, so the updated value then, so is 55 billion pounds a year, which is colossal, um, but making that, breaking that down on average 300,000 pounds a year that any one church will bring to its economy in value. Um, and we tried to measure it in the market and non-market value, so that you know, the, the close values, and then you actually go out um, the other values that come um, from all the activities that happen in a church. Um, there's the social and well-being value. There's a value to people who volunteer because you can measure the value to someone for their personal health and their well-being if they are able to volunteer. It's really good for them. As well as that, the people who are availing themselves of the services, there's a value to them. If they come and uh, there might be a debt counselling service or a coffee morning for people who are locally, <coughs> there's a value that you can put on that. And then, of course, all the things that happen, food banks are key um, at the moment, but youth groups, all the other mental health services, other things that churches provide for their communities, how much would it cost if you had to replace those if they weren't there? And so you get to this, this huge value. Whoops, what's going on here? Oh, that's it. Oh, that's the last one. Anyway, so, so there's, there's an awful lot more I could say um, if, I had, if I had more time. But the important thing is to note that churches, uh, we mustn't let them, uh, in, in the whole of Europe, not just, not just the UK, we mustn't let them be um, neglected and undervalued. And don't let, let's not let people... Um, forget the huge value, not only for people to worship, for people to, uh, to meet in, uh, in their community, to stop people feeling lonely, to stop people, you know, to improve people's well-being. Um, we want to do another study. We hope to get funding shortly to do a little bit more um, and some more research. And, and then, of course, to concentrate on the green agenda and looking into all of the... Um, carbon neutral, and, and of course it's much better to keep an old building in operation than to knock it down, the, the, the cost of 
demolition and so on is very bad for the environment and, and why would you do that when you can use an old building and all of those things. We want to produce more research and more uh, advocacy and do some more lobbying around that. Um, so that's a whistle stop, uh, a tour of the House of Good I suppose. Do keep connected, do sign up to our e-newsletter, do sign up as a friend uh, if, if you aren't already and so on. Um, I think these slides will be available afterwards and also I'll, I'll be around to talk. And of course, if you want to bid for my two copies of that, please, please do. Uh, but um, thank you, thank you very much um, for listening. So, hello everybody. Uh, we are from Slovakia. My name is Peter and my colleague uh, is David Rushka and we come from the um, Civil Association uh, Gothic Route or Gothic, Gotická Cesta in Slovak. And there's two of us because we are kind of large of teams of volunteers and we represent many sites. Uh, so we wanted to have a representation of it, not just by one person, but by two of us. So I'll let my colleague David uh, speak in the first five minutes and then <laughs> five minutes I'll take for myself. I think it does you. I think it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Well. Let, me, let, me, let me look at that. Where is the... Mm -hmm. yeah. Meanwhile, you can... Okay, I will use this. It's okay. Fine. And we can take off this. Okay. <laughs> but all the cables... How does the cables. microphone work? Which one is it? <laughs> no. no, it is the other one. <laughs> this one you have to keep. Just a second. <laughs> so... Okay, so um, so this is Gotická cesta, the Gothic route. It's an, a non-governmental association. We work as a group of uh, uh, students, architects, art historians, or historians to protect the um, cultural heritage in one quite forgotten region in Slovakia. As you can see, it's situated on the south of the central Slovakia. It's quite a mountainous region, uh, which we can divide in four valleys. And in these valleys, we can visit uh, incredible medieval churches that came from 13th to 15th century, and uh, which are important by its, um, their interiors, which are decorated by the medieval frescoes. The region was... Um, quite rich in the Middle Ages because of the mining uh, of the iron ore and the local nobility could uh, pay for the construction of these churches. The nobility visited uh, Italy, they visited uh, the papal residence in Avignon, so they have the, the experience with the contemporary art of the 14th century, and they brought this, um, this idea to this region. Uh, but today the situation is completely different. It's one of the poorest regions in Slovakia. It's far from the big centers. There is no infrastructure, and people leave the region because they can't find the, the work. It's, there is the big unemployment in the region, and so this incredible heritage uh, has problems to be preserved and uh, also another problem is that people do, do not, don't know that this, um, that this is something exceptional. So we decided to change the situation as uh, volunteers and uh, to organize uh, different events in the, in the churches and to show these churches not just for the tourists, but uh, also for the local people, because just them can change the situation. So we organize uh, small festivals in the churches. Um, we put the living uh, art in these uh, monuments, like uh, music, theater, contemporary art. But also we, we want to join specialists from different countries that can arrive in the region and present their work on the field of architecture or history of architecture, medieval, uh, um, sacral art, um, and so on, because we organize a conference like this one. And from the conference, uh, we can print, uh, we print uh, an anthology, which is available, available for people. So, so also the idea of spreading the information about the cultural heritage. So I will pass. 
the words to Peter. Okay, okay. Uh, I think I got my micro microphone. Thank you, David. Uh, so as David uh, mentioned, we are uh, an NGO full of volunteers. Uh, so it was kind of hard uh, for us and we didn't really live in the region. We came from the capital of Bratislava, which is far, uh, four hours of driving uh, from this region. So it was kind of hard for us to organize the events and so on. Uh, so we worked uh, with the communities and uh, started, all, of course, with the owners of the churches, which were uh, parishes mostly uh, of Lutheran or uh, evangelical <laughs> denomination. But the region itself is uh, full of Catholics and uh, reformed uh, parishes, which are bound to a Hungarian nationality, so Calvinist. So we got a region that has a large structural problem. We have a, not a really good demography. We have large unemployment. And uh, this is actually one of the most atheistic regions in Slovakia. And the rest of the people that still have faith, uh, they are divided into three different denominations. So it is kind of hard to struggle with this uh, demographics going on. Because in every village, like with 200 people, you've got two churches. So it's like five people showing up on a mass and so on uh, because uh, most of these churches even though in the like state of reconstruction uh, they are still alive and uh, they still uh, do the masses and uh, uh, the god servings so of course owners are the most important layer of this because they have to uh, they have to have the uh, the further idea they have to see uh, that probably the, the sacral uh, function of these sites is going to an end in long-term run. Uh, so what to do with it? That's uh, why we are really glad that we are here and we were approached by the uh, Future for Religious Heritage because that's actually the problem that we are struggling with. And it's good to see you all having the same issues. Uh, then, of course, uh, we as volunteers, then Ministry of Culture of Slovakia is, of course, the biggest founder or the donator of the preservation works, uh, but we are working on a project basis. So we have to write a project, then you have no idea if it will get, get approved. So you start in, uh, a few years work on etaps uh, in some circles, but then one year you don't get the funds, so then you have to stop the work. So that's kind of a struggle that we try to help the parishes to write the project and to co-fund them as well, as we are trying to bring some donations in and. Uh, and also some uh, some sponsors uh, to help these these like I would say really poor parishes to maintain those uh, those large churches. Uh, then in the recent years, uh, we tried to uh, look for the common cause with other organizations that are really important for this, mostly to bring those churches and uh, for the public uh, because they are not well known even in Slovakia. In Hungary, that's different because uh, they know much more about the. Uh, Hungarian uh, history uh, as the kingdom as as uh, people in Slovakia do unfortunately and uh, so destination management organizations of self-governing regions uh, of course it's in Banska Bistrica and also of the Gemer region itself so those are like natural partners that we try to approach also not only for funding but mostly for for the support political support and also for uh, I would say spread of the word and the marketing. Uh, then regional support partnership organizations, they mostly, mostly work with state funds, with municipalities and with uh, entrepreneurs, which are as well important, but that's the field that we just like to approach. Uh, then of course, municipalities are as important as all the partners above. Uh, so we try to do it uh, like really a platform for, for cooperation. Um, to help not only the churches themselves, but the local communities and the municipalities to develop through the influx of, uh, of importance of the, uh, of the churches itself. Then, of course, as our, ourselves, NGOs are as important as well, uh, because the sustainability is not about only about the churches, it's about the communities. And I don't mean only parish communities, but also us as, as volunteers. Uh, we have to find the solution to our functioning. Finishing. Okay, good. And of course, international partners, we are trying to get into European funds to approach that kind of sustainability. The last year, we were actually 
able to get the European Heritage label, which actually gave us that kind of platform that we can build up upon. And that's our team of volunteers. Thank you, and we can chat later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have been requested to uh, to present this project. Uh, I myself am uh, I myself have participated in a few field outings, but I am presently located in Sweden, so it's not my primary project. But I am. Uh, but as the, their situation is far worse than mine, and I am doing the presenting. So thank you for having me. Apologies that I can't be there in person, and uh, I will welcome any and all questions by email, either to myself or to the main. Um, or to the main uh, colleagues responsible for the project. Without further ado, the Legion and Fire project is conducted by the NGO Workshop for the Academic Study of Religions, which is an NGO that has basically united most young scholars of religion in Ukraine for the last decade and has, before the war, we conducted workshops, seminars, summer schools, training sessions, and so on. And since the war began, we've been conducting monitoring of religious heritage sites affected by the Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, we do both field and open source monitoring. So field work has been conducted in three regions, 70 cities visited, over 70 by now really, over 180 buildings inspected. And oh, but we use open source data to follow what's going on right now in the regions that are currently inaccessible to us. And this is mo mostly, this is primarily uh, the east of Ukraine and the south of Ukraine, where the destruction is much worse than in the center, but we really don't have access to all of that right now. Work is obviously ongoing. As I said, it began in May 2022. So if you're aware of the timeline of the war, it means that the work began basically immediately after the Russians withdrew from Kiev. And uh, as you, if you can take a look at the sort of these two maps, you can see how different the situation is right now. Uh, a year ago, in March 2022, this is a map from March 29, I believe. Uh, Russian troops were closing in on Kiev, and really fighting was going on right near the capital. Since then. Uh, Russian troops have withdrawn from the north of Ukraine, withdrawn from the Kharkiv area, and right now, uh, and right now, well, most of the fighting is going on in the east, in the Donbas, in the Luhansk regions, and in southern Ukraine, so near Novokakhovka, Mariupol, and other cities. Now, one thing that should be mentioned here is that the fighting has actually basically destroyed our most religiously diverse region the most religious diversity in ukraine was found over the over, over, over in this area for historical reasons you had buddhists neo-protestants all sorts of christian orthodox churches uh so the south of ukraine is home to most of our muslim muslim community so really this uh, this war has uh this war has well decimated Ukrainian religious diversity. Even, and, well, to show what damage looks like, yeah, this is uh, this is a 19th century church of the nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary in, Zhitom in the Zhitomir region. No restoration efforts are underway. 19th century wooden church, really part of the fairly unique Ukrainian heritage of wooden churches that uh, they're ubiquitous, really, all over Ukraine. But this church and many others like it are, well, they're in no shape to be restored and really there's no resources to restore them. But we'll talk a little bit about that once we go over some of the statistics. So the metrics we use, the degree of damage of religious buildings, complete destruction is if more than 75% of the building is damaged, it can't be reconstructed. Uh, heavy is 4575 of the building, and medium is 1545 if it's just reparations, but it can still be used, and weak is up to 15%. So this would this one would be heavy damage rather than complete destruction. You will see complete destruction a little bit later. Uh, the statistics by region, you can see really where the very heavy fighting went on. The... Uh, the small the small damage to destroyed in the west are random rocket strikes 
in the north in the Kiev region, you can see 73, but that's also because it's the most well documented region as um, as uh, workshop, the workshop for the academic study of religion is based in Kiev. You can see some destruction in the north, but less so because the main vector of attack was through the Kiev region. And of course, in the south, you have the greatest scale of destruction, but also the least documented because we have no access to un an ongoing war zone. Uh, this is uh, this is nearly the same data, but this is the most recent data. So the pretty pictures you have are from our most recent report that goes up to February 2023, but I have been authorized to present the ongoing results. So, so also the uh, since there's weekly outings, these graphs get uh, added on to weekly. So, yeah, again, you can see how how the most are by far in the donuts region, but um, uh, yeah, but the but Kiev is very close, and uh, and and but also the regions that we don't have access to, Luhansk region and Kharkiv region are well, they're they're nearly as close as to the Donetsk, but yeah. So what's the denominational uh what's the denominational sort of aspect of this? Now, by far the greatest amount of religious buildings that have been destroyed belong to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchy, which is ironic considering that the defense of religion is one of the main pretexts for this war. The whole idea that that Ukraine is home to dangerous, even satanic sects and um uh, and sort of proper Russians must be defended from that. But Ukraine, uh, so the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchy was one of the most prolific churches site-wise in Ukraine. And you can see that in the picture. But what you can also see is that Protestants as a group of uh, Christian denominations have a disproportionately large amount of destruction towards their, towards their buildings. And this is because, obviously, because uh, Protestantism, Protestantism is seen as one of the cultural enemies. So, yeah, they get a disproportionate amount of sort of conscious attacks. While well, Ukrainian Orthodox churches are mostly destroyed just because they were unfortunately positioned or very visible or got hit by a missile, Protestants are targeted far more explicitly. So we can say that there's war crimes towards minorities going on. Here's the same information in sort of uh, in in the most updated form. You can see that uh, you can see that while the you, the Orthodox Church in Moscow Patriarchy holds just over fifty percent, Protestants hold thirty three percent, which is considering the the proportion of Orthodox to Protestantism, which is far more than far more than uh, one to two. So. Uh, yeah, it is impossible to say that there is no targeting going on. That's very obvious from the data. The documentation purposes for this project are basically twofold. Uh, one, the first one and the primary one is war crime documentation. So the damage or destruction of religious buildings, use of it for military purposes, making it into a military target, and the looting and persecution of believers during the occupation. And uh, so a big part of the project is mo is uh, preparing material so this can be prosecuted in international courts. The other less successful side of the project is reconstruction efforts, which I think you guys, uh, which I think this audience will be more interested in hearing about. And the picture there looks fairly grim. And because there are no resources for reconstructors, reconstruction from the government, this, uh, I mean, religious buildings are as low priority as you can get in this respect. And there is no architectural expertise on site to be had. There's no systematic effort to so to to create sort of, uh, to create models or ways of reconstructing from what's left over. So the reconstruction efforts are mostly driven by communities in that way that yeah, they do what they can in the in a in an amateur way, and sometimes with the help of other religious communities or with their co-faith believers. So what does this look like? So this is the Church of St. George in Zavorishi village. This is Kiev region, and this was before the war. As you can see, this is a fairly, this is a fairly standard wooden Ukrainian church. Uh, 19th century, probably most of these are 19th century, uh, and uh, yeah, 
this is this is just your standard this is just your standard village church generally in good condition and uh, construct the perishable material but regularly maintained this is how it looked directly after the war directly after the withdrawal so as you can see this is what complete destruction looks looks like just torn down to the bedrock and uh, and this is and this is the current version of what's of what's uh, what they've done with it so yeah it has some space uh it has a it has some space for um uh, it has some space for it uh, for the uh, for the reconstruction but um well uh but uh, but this isn't but but nobody's conducted any sort of restoration work. You have people coming in to pray, maybe, but that's about it. This is what uh, this is what a less damaged site looks like, and a damaged site that has uh, more affluence. So this is the Pokrovska, this is the Pokrovska Church in Malin, Zhitomir region. As you can see, it just got hit by some shelling, not that much. And uh, and uh, since this is the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia, some independent denomination of the Russian Orthodox Church, they got help from their Bulgarian co-believers. And uh, since they had more money to, to do this, they actually have proper construction equipment. But again, no architectural expertise, nothing that can, no sort of professional restoration efforts, and they're not particularly likely to be forthcoming. So to conclude, the Ruijan Fire Project has conducted monitoring of over 450 sites of religious heritage, primarily in the liberated regions of central and northern Ukraine, where they have physical monitoring ongoing and eastern Ukraine via reports. The project will continue until, well, until we're done monitoring, until we've collected all the sites that we're aware of. Of the sites that have been monitored, approximately half have suffered medium or heavy damage, so they're not usable at all, or were completely destroyed. And uh, most sites, from what colleagues tell me, are 19th century. Many are wooden architecture, really. So this is a huge blow to Ukrainian architectural heritage in general and religious architecture specifically, because quite a few of these were unique. Despite the pretext of the war being to sort of defend Russian citizens and the Russian Orthodox faith, most of the sites belong to the Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchy because, well, the shellings don't really care what site you are unless you're Protestant because sites belonging to religious minorities and the most visible are Protestant sites are damaged to a disproportionately large degree. In addition to the shelling, you get specific targeting by by Russians who who would like to see orthodoxy as the sole religion in the region. Reconstruction efforts from the state are likely not forthcoming. There are no resources to be had. And so most of the reconstruction is conducted on an amateur level by the religious communities themselves. The lucky ones get help from co-believers, but nobody else. And there's really no architectural expertise or oversight usually present, nor is there an organized effort to provide that. Right. So to conclude, the picture does look fairly bleak, better than what would have been had the Russians succeeded in annexing Kiev and uh, north of Ukraine, but still, but still bad and still well worse for worse for especially the people in the south and the east where the destruction is ongoing. These are the contact details and for further information. Uh, so there's been pr multiple presentations, there's annual reports, and uh, there's ongoing there's ongoing monitoring reports, of course. So if you would like to follow the project, this is how you can do that. You can follow either the workshop for the academic study of religions itself or the Religion on Fire project. Most of the data that I presented to you are found, is found in the annual reports, but you have slightly more updated. You have a few, like two months more worth of field, field trips. So that's usually six to eight field trips. And uh, yeah, so thank you for your attention. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to contact us. Or if you have any suggestions, such as what sort of 
what sort of efforts could be undertaken to help in the conservation of restoration, we would be very, very glad to hear it. Thank you so much, colleagues, and I hope you all have a pleasant conference. Thank you. Hi. Um, so, um, uh, it's lovely to be here. I've, I've been in this room once before um, for a conference uh, organised by the diocese and it's lovely to be back. So I'm going to talk about how we can, how can use events to, um, to, to promote the sustainability um, in, uh, of, of religious heritage. And my, my perspective comes from three different areas. Firstly, I was an event manager for 25 years and then I was uh, an academic in events management for 14 years, and, and I'm also a priest. So, so I kind of combine all of my passions. And, and it, it started me thinking about the role of events in the use and promotion of a preserved religious heritage. And I guess the question is, once you have preserved the religious heritage, what do you do with it? How do you help people to engage with it? Um, and so, yeah, so, so one of the things I want to talk to, uh, to you about is what I call the eventization of faith. And what we've seen in culture as a whole is that, is that uh, we've lived our lives before the pandemic through events, haven't we? we? We went to events in our business life, we went to events in our social life, in our leisure time. Um, in all of our interests was part of events and we've really missed out on that uh, uh, massively. Um, and what we found is that trend is, is coming back uh, and like the rest of society, churches have joined in by either um, hosting events in their spaces whereby they are, they're either for their own people, for the people of faith or their local communities, but in, uh, increasingly beginning to um, actually hire out their spaces. And that comes with some complications. So, so uh, this has led to, this overall ev eventization of life has led to uh, this concept of venification, which means that Basically, everywhere is a venue. So the outside, the park outside is a venue. The church is a venue. Everywhere is a venue. Uh, and, and that's part of being able to build a sustainable future. That's three minutes, yeah? OK. Um, just checking. And, and so, it, but in terms of that sustainability is in terms of economic sustainability, environmental sustainability, uh, social and spiritual sustainability. So we're kind of talking about all of those different things. Um, and so the problem is that you need good practice. So if you're running events, who, who here has run an event? Like probably everybody, yes. And have you had any training in it? Have you read an events management textbook? Um, you should do. Uh, but, <laughs> but what happens is it's much more difficult because you actually don't know what you're doing necessarily. And so you make more mistakes. And when things happen, which they do happen in events, and they go wrong, you're kind of like, what do we do? So you, you waste more time. And the, the, there's a complicating factor, which is in sacred spaces, uh, you have theological perspectives. So for example, my friend from Spain says, this is what we do in our churches. And when I tell her that in my church, Back in, back in Bingley in West Yorkshire, we have a beer festival and we have a Pink Floyd a tribute band playing in the church. People are horrified. But the difference is theology yeah, and theological perspective. And we have to take that into account. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about um, a couple of examples, very briefly. Uh, but what people are looking for now is connection. And what events in the, in the secular world are trying to do is to build connection. They actually call it transcendence. And what we have is we have thousands and thousands and thousands, possibly more than maybe a million, I don't know. We have sacred spaces where that's built in. 
where people come to a sacred space and they expect to engage, to meet with God, to experience the numinous. That's what they expect to do. So it's kind of, it's kind of a, a benefit to us. So quickly, um, uh, this example, the, the Lindisfarne Gospels, uh, is normally kept uh, kind of behind locked doors in the British Library. And every now and again, they let it out to where it actually came from. And what happened in 2013 was they eventized all of that process and they developed, they, they had the core event, which is come and see the book. Yeah, come and see the book. And then they had, here's about a, um, a whole load of other events, engaging with children in schools and so on. And then they had about a thousand events connected in the, the region from, from Scotland to the north of England. Um, so that's kind of that provides a model for the kind of thing that can happen. The other thing is is a, a new perspective, which is um, virtual pilgrimage. So all of us have the opportunity to connect online now. So, okay, um, but have a look at have a look at uh, some of this. But ten million people participated, and I just want to talk just very briefly that. The, there are practical design and operational considerations. So thinking about the financial aspects, where, it, where the place is, where the space is, how easy is it to get to? What does, it, does it have a toilet? Does it have a kitchen? Does it have a leaking roof? And so on. And, and who's going to use it? And the key to all this is, is support in terms of how to run events, but also that the local people actually build the events that they need and decide what they want. Thank you. Uh, in your presentation, you talked about uh, economic and social values. Now, economic values is something we can quantify. But uh, how do you quantify the social values? And uh, second question is also about if you're quantifying the social values, then how much of community involvement is uh, considered? Like, uh, do you do community consultations to understand these social values? Or is it just uh, very matrix-based? Like, you quantify it based on the involvement or based on the initiatives. So, how, what is the procedure of quantifying social value? Just wait for the Um, I think I understood the whole question, but the social value is um, things like um, people who, t who attend um, as, a, you know, something that's given as a voluntary service, so they might turn up, for, as I say, for a coffee morning, or they might turn up for, um, we have a debt counselling service, or those sorts of things, um, so there is a value for the person, that, that there is a way in the economics can measure, uh, I forget how you do it, with the, the algorithm, um, that you can measure how uh, how much benefit people derive from, from that. And then you, 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 we have a survey with how many, we, you have to look at how many people come um, to, to, uh, to avail themselves of the services, how many out of the community come to that e each um, week in each particular church. And we had a load of stats. And there's also a big... Um, uh, a big survey that the government did that, that you can access and then you get the numbers from that and you do the number crunching and so on. Um, so it's, I can't explain the economics very well here, but that, that is how, how you do it. Um, and the social, um, the well-being, there's a, there's a measurement called the well-being, which can measure uh, the effects of having um, these influences for, for people so that they their well-being can be measured and it has a knock-on effect that um, if your well-being is helped, if you like, and your loneliness is affected, then you, it stops you having um, having maybe to go to the GP to get other interventions, which again, you, they can put a measurement on that. So and, and, um, it's, it's more complicated than I can explain, but that's how we do it. But there was a lot of um, statistics in the background that were used um, to do all the number crunching. There, there is a very detailed... Um, report and explanation that, that is on our website that's, you know, the, the, the real economics and the sti sti um, statistics and all the numbers and so on behind the scenes that went into it. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, it's not a question for you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you, you produce the report to have a certain impact yeah. in society and with decision makers. 
So could you talk about you know the impact that was achieved? Were you happy with it? Did it have the right sort of outcomes that you were hoping for? Yes. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, so uh, the in particular, um, the government, um, historic England, and, and so on, were particularly welcomed the report because they really liked the way um, that it measured heritage and helped them in finding different ways um, to, to measure the value of heritage because they have obviously other heritage to look at as well as um, the ecclesiastical built heritage. Um, and I think that was a big um, influencer in helping us to get the money from the Culture Recovery Fund and we distributed that to 32 churches that were in need and other uh, we weren't the only people to receive that, um, the Church of England and others received um, monies for that as well. Um, but I think as an, on an ongoing, it, it's had an ongoing impact in terms of uh, giving people a really good tool for, for um, just really articulating the value in, in something that people can understand and can put their finger on if you like. I mean, they, in, I didn't say earlier on, uh, if you put one pound in to a church building, we can say guarantee that that has a 16 pounds worth of return. So the multiplying factor is, is huge. The return on a donor's investment is huge. Um, yeah, I mean that's, I think there's an ongoing, there's an ongoing impact. The other thing we would like to develop now, uh, which we are trying to work on, is a sort of calculator for individual churches. So whatever services an individual church is able to provide, and, that, and however big or small it, its congregation and its community, um, that we want to make a sort of like little ready calculator thing so that people can put their different activities and different volunteer numbers and different people <coughs> values in, and then out it will spit out how much value that particular church gives, which is sometimes more helpful than the, the massive figure for the whole of the UK. A bit like when you go online to find your house insurance or something, you put all the figures in and it come, you know, you number crunches it, a little bit like that. Yeah. I have a question for Katerina. First of all, um, when, I, when I listen to her, and we are looking at the numbers of, uh, of the destroyed uh, religious, religious heritage, and we are sitting here gathering safe and sound, it makes me feel very humble, I have to say. And secondly, really a question, um, <coughs> Is, is religion on fire somehow connected, supported, um, or connected to organizations, supported by organizations for restoration, for assisting, for resources, etc.? Do you have experts volunteering from Europe, from organizations like FRH or others? Is there any interest by ECOMOS, UNESCO, even if it wasn't a UNESCO um, World Heritage Site which was destroyed? So is there support? I acknowledge. <laughs> now we should yes. yes. Now we got to. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Did you, yeah. <laughs> Did you hear the question? Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, but I couldn't hear much of the question. So, to reiterate, since everything's been being conducted by religious organizations, and apparently there's volunteer organizations in Europe, correct? Yeah. Uh, now I can't see you either. Um, since everything's being conducted, is there, like, so if I understood the, the question correctly, that there's expertise available in Europe, and maybe there's a way to yes. connect the two. No, what, what Did I get that right? What institution, what institution support yeah. is there for our work? Yeah, so we would, we would be happy, we would actually be happy to connect the two. So if there is a way, please contact the Workshop for Academic Religious Studies project with the contact details. Uh, uh, so, <coughs> yes, so if there's expertise to be had or if there's resources to be had, we would be very happy to connect you guys to religious communities. Uh, as it is, it's primarily community driven. Are you happy? 
Susan? I think, Susan, there is a call from the European Commission Expert Heritage Group, which has approached Average also to apply and uh, to go in in a subgroup specifically on Ukraine. So if everybody is interested to join the subgroup, please send an email to George. Because uh, as the religious heritage is the most, uh, in percentage-wise, most damage of the heritage sites in uh, Europe, we definitely should try to be in the subgroup of the European Commission. Thank you. So we would like to uh, cooperate, because you get uh, an enormous update. There is a question behind the video. Yeah. You can take the microphone. Well, there is a question. For okay. Um, I, I just actually wanted to uh, compliment uh, Peter and, and David because I think it's inspirational for everyone to see uh, the younger generation stepping up and, and working with the owners and, and users of this religious heritage. And I look forward to being able to uh, have you speak out more through FRH to all our members to inspire other groups. And that's one of our main uh, objectives is to be a source of best practices and clearly you're on onto something. <laughs> Think you want to comment that? So, well, maybe one thing that's um, one of the things which are the most difficult in our work is to find young people in the region. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe more difficult than the money is. <laughs> yeah, I'll write you to so I'm glad to cooperate. There were some questions. You were, uh, can you really pass the mic from behind you? Yeah. So, who has questions? We might not have. No, very quick question for Katarina. Is there, uh, perhaps you can tell the conference, is there a way that we can donate to the work of uh, the Roots on Fire project? Is there a way? Do you need a question or not really? So is there a way that we can donate to support the work that Katarina's under? I think it would be easier if you repeat, if you just repeat yeah. it near the microphone. Yeah, so are there donations that can be made to this project? Uh, are there donations that can be made to the project? Yes, I, mostly it's, mostly it's uh, funded by, mostly it's funded by grants, uh, by grants, but yes, there's, there are donations that can be made. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, if you don't mind, Jordi, I will, I will, give, I will send you the details uh, because I mean, right now, obvious, well, pretty much everybody in Ukraine is collecting donations. Uh, I'll send you the details and uh, and then uh, uh, and the uh, and then we'll we'll pass it on because yes, I mean, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, maybe we get. Thank you for very interesting contributions. Um, my comments are less of a question than rather an observation. Um, I ran an organization um, in England which dealt with uh, redundant non-Anglican churches of high architectural and historic interest. And we thought it, we set up a charity and the idea was to revive them, not to ignore their previous religious use, but to add to that. And one of the ways in which we found we could appeal to people was by not uh, uh, emphasizing the previous use, but, but um, by encouraging local people to take an interest in a building that was often very close to where they lived and to ensure that it didn't fall into gross disrepair and possibly get demolished or simply be left to, to what. And the way we could do that was by setting up local committees following a public meeting from which a few activists would join a committee to revive social activities of a suitable nature in the church or chapel, and also to allow occasional services of worship 
uh, on the basis that we would not be com competing with other local churches um, that may themselves be quarrel, uh, be, be um, in, in decline in terms of worshipping numbers. And we found that that was a formula that worked very well and that we said about four to six social events a year would be fine. And if we did get a request for a marriage or a baptism, yes, we'd go ahead with that, but we didn't tout for that kind of business. So we didn't offend local people in any way. And we found it was a financial and social success over a long over the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody who wants to comment on this one? Sorry, I just had a good question for Claire. Oh, okay. yes, yeah, very good. Um, Claire, you said that um, you look after all the churches um, across Great Britain. Do you look after the churches that have been um, appropriated for maybe other faiths or other uses as well? The, uh, the remit of the National Churches <coughs> Trust is, is to support churches that are still open for worship and uh, and still active in that sense. So, uh, no, <laughs> I mean, churches that are closed or, um, I use the word redundant, in other words, we, are not part of our remit. No, so, if they're being used for other faiths, yeah. uh, they're, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. they're still open for Christian worship. But we, uh, we say a minimum of six services a year counts as still open for Thank you for all the contribution, that, but especially for your contribution, uh, because as I'm a theologian too, I'm working in Germany at the Martin Luther University in Saxonia, a small uh, country, a small state of Germany. And my, my work is based on the question, how can deal and uh, work together to reason and parish churches and monastery churches. And I had a, a just finished, uh, I think half a year ago, a small study about uh, monastery gardens and spiritual tourism. And you talked about uh, uh, the transcendence and, uh, and wide use, in my words, I would say. And, but I made the experience that especially stakeholders of the churches and the monasteries have a lot of problems with the term tourism. And uh, how do you work with these stakeholders to make them open for the wide use of the beautiful experience for all people of Trans And um, well, one of one of the things that, that I've done, I, I know that, that Lillian and some other FRH people have been there. Um, we've been to the Vatican, and they are very concerned about uh, monasteries and convents and so on which are, are, are decreasing in numbers of monks and nuns, but, but they still have all the buildings and all everything. And, and I think that that's part of the, um, the whole discussion. It's not just about local churches saying, this is what we want to do. It's actually about denominations saying, we need to do something about this. And, and that, that events is part of that solution. <coughs> Um, but there are things, there are steps that come come before that. I'm happy to share some of my work with you. It'd be really good to talk later. Yeah. Okay.